All back for program number four this afternoon. And for those of you joining us on television, why we trust you understand that I think I better explain this real quickly, that these once a week programs, as you see them on the air, are current. Of course, you all realize that. And then you watch me on Monday through Friday, and all of a sudden I'm 15 years younger. Well, it's just because those are reruns. But uh, a year from now, I'm going to be pretty close, so I'll look just as old on those reruns as I do on the weekends. But that's the format. The weekend programs are are weekly, and uh, the daily programs are reruns. Okay, yes, my little wife and everybody in the front row are reminding me. We are in book 76. We're on the last set of four programs, and so the next taping will be the first part of book 77. I got it done. <laughs> I got it done. Okay, this is book 76. All right, we're going to go to the next mystery, and I wish I had two half-hour programs, but since this is going to end book 76, some of it may have to go on into book 77 for those of you out on TV, but uh, I'm going to try and sandwich this in as quickly as I can. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. Another one of the mysteries that were revealed to the Apostle Paul that had never ever been even hinted at. And I got to emphasize that because everybody tries to blenderize it and say, well, the two taken at the mill, one taken to the left is the rapture. John 14, where God says, I will go and prepare a place for you. That's the rapture. No, it couldn't be because then God would be betraying the, the secret and God doesn't work that way. God does not lie. All right, now here is the secret that's never been revealed before. And whenever I get letters of opposition, and it's getting worse and worse, not just for me, but for everybody that is proclaiming this end-time event, the rapture, it's coming under attack more and more. In fact, I mentioned last week at the conference, in 1998, Tim LaHaye wrote a book, Rapture, Under Attack. Then already... Well, now it is 10 years later, and it's just been compounded, and it's no longer a kind letter that says, well, Les, I just can't agree. Now they attack, see? Where do you get such a dumb idea? And uh, a lot of them like to refer to this Margaret MacDonald. Oh, the minute I see that for you out on television, if you're going to write to me on the rapture, don't mention Margaret MacDonald, because when you do, your letter goes straight in the trash can. And I don't mind telling people that. I got one just the other day, and the first thing I saw, Margaret MacDonald. I didn't even read it. <laughs> Wastebasket. You know who Margaret MacDonald was? No. Most people don't, unless you're in my position. But I first ran into it, I'm going to say at least 20 years ago, in one of the five cities where I go and teach. And it happened because many of the people in this one particular large church were in my weeknight class. And he got wind of the fact that I was teaching a rapture. Well, the next Sunday, he puts out hundreds and hundreds of copies of where this idea of the rapture began. And how it went back to the middle 1800s, at the time of John Darby, that there was this teenage girl who was running on less than a full tank mentally. You got it. <laughs> and she had a vision. And in this vision, she saw the Bible opened up dispensationally and the rapture. And so she took it, supposedly, to John Darby, and John Darby just jumped on it. Now listen, John Darby was one of the top theologians of his time, middle 1800s. He had already published his own Bible translation. I've got a copy someplace. Tremendous scholar. And you think he would listen to a teenage girl who wasn't all there? But see, that's what they're trying to tell people, that this whole concept was given to John Darby by this whatever, and that he latched on to it, and then from that point on, we have the rise of dispensationalism. That's a lie straight out of the head office of the God of this world, Satan. Don't you ever believe it. Now, I think I shared in the last taping. I had a poor gentleman, I think he was from Kentucky, 88 years old. And he said, Les, I've used my Schofield Bible since I was saved 60 years ago, and now I saw this on the Internet. And he sent me a copy of it. And just pure garbage 
trying to destroy the veracity and the validity of the Schofield Study Bible. Just literally ridiculing it and had all kinds of reasons why nobody should use it. Well, see, those are the satanic attacks that are coming in in these last days. All right, now, of all the letters that I've had through the years, and there aren't that many, probably what? One a month, if that? I doubt it. We get hundreds of letters a day, and if you get one a month, that's only one out of thousands. But they just immediately start showing me all these scripture verses to refute my teaching of the rapture. Well, where are they getting all their scripture? Old Testament, the four Gospels, and the book of Revelation, and they totally ignore Paul's epistles. So what do I do? I just skim through it, and if I don't see a reference to any of Paul's epistles, wastebasket. They haven't got an ounce of ground to stand on. Why should I bother trying to prove my point? Because the first thing these people have to understand is, as I've already said, only Paul has anything to do with the rapture because only Paul teaches the body of Christ. And anybody can see that by just simply reading the rest of Scripture, and you will not find one reference, not one, to the body of Christ except Romans through Philemon. That's all. Well, now, does that take such an intellect to put two and two together? That if this apostle alone was given the revelation of these mysteries that would bring about the body of Christ, that these other places would have reference to it and still be called a secret? It can't happen, see? All right, so here's the key. Here's the key. Verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery, a secret. And here's the secret. We shall not all sleep or die physically, but we shall all be changed. Now that's obvious. When we come to the end of the church age, there are going to be living believers. Well, is God going to kill them all first so he can resurrect them from the dead? Well, no way. No way. So once he's resurrected the believers of the body who have died, and they're reunited with their soul and spirit, then the next event is to change those of us who are still on planet Earth from this body to the new resurrected body in an instant. And they can't seem to buy into that because I guess it's too hard. Hey, with God, nothing is impossible, see? All right, so I'm going to do quickly what I did the other night over a period of an hour, and that is show that this idea of believers being taken off the planet before the tribulation begins has absolutely nothing to do with the horrors of the tribulation, which are death and destruction. Not one word. Okay, now I'm going to have to watch time. Ordinarily, I don't do that. But on this half hour, I'm going to watch my time. Let's turn first and foremost back to Revelation chapter 6. Now, ordinarily, when I teach Revelation 6, I like to also use Matthew 24, but I'm not going to do that for sake of time today. But in Revelation chapter 6, you can start with verse 1. And here we have the appearance of the Antichrist, or the next event after the rapture has taken place. The church is now gone because we can have nothing to do with death and destruction, which I'm going to show you in these next 18 minutes. But here we do. This is prophecy concerning the second coming. All right, the first seal is the appearance of the white horse, the fake Christ, the Antichrist. All right, then verse 3. And when he had opened the second seal... I heard the second creature say, come and see. And there went out another horse that was red. And this red horse had power to take peace from the earth. All right, now back up real quickly to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And ordinarily, Paul makes very little allusion to prophecy, except in rare occasions, and I think this is one of them, as well as in Second Thessalonians. 
But in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, did I say 4? I meant 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, just start at verse 1. Now this is right after his comparison passage with 1 Corinthians 15 up in chapter 4. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together, verse 17, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. All right, now you drop down into chapter 5, and we're going to be dealing with those that are left behind. See? All right, but of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I run to you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord, now that's the tribulation, those final seven years are called the day of the Lord. For the day of the Lord cometh as a thief in the night, for, now watch this, when they, that is the world's population, when they shall say peace and safety. Now that's the white horse of Revelation 6. The Antichrist is going to come in promising peace and prosperity. Israel will be euphoric. They're going to have permission to rebuild their temple. They can lay down their military. Antichrist is going to promise their borders and their safety, see? And the whole world is in euphoria with him. This guy is supposedly almost the copy of the, of the, of the true Christ, see? All right, so now Paul is telling us, yes, when the tribulation opens, it's going to be peace and safety. Then, what's the next event? sudden destruction. All right, now come back to Revelation 6 again, and that's exactly what you've got. After the white horse of peace and safety, now you come into the second horse, and it's red. And this horse takes away peace from the earth, and they're going to end up killing one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. Now I associate that with the prophecy of Ezekiel 38 and 39, where Russia, heading up many of the Muslim nations of the world, will invade Israel. Well, I put it toward the end of the first year of the seven because in biblical history, if a king came on the throne as much as one day before the end of a year and goes into the next year, that one day was considered a full year. That's biblical timing. All right. Now, if this Russian invasion then comes along at about the 11th month of the tribulation, then Israel still has one month of that year plus six full years to fulfill Ezekiel 39, which says that they will take seven years to clean up the residue of this destroyed Russian army on the hills of Israel. That's why I put it in the 11th month of the seven years of tribulation. All right, but its peace has been taken from the earth. All right, now drop all the way down as a result of that invasion. Of course, there's going to be tremendous loss of food production because I honestly feel the Russians are going to preempt everything they've got on North America, knowing that we would come to Israel's defense but we're going to have enough nukes out there in submarines and flying in planes and maybe some silos that will survive, and we will retaliate and do the same to Russia. So you've got Russia obliterated, you've got America obliterated, the two greatest food production areas of the world are gone. So what's the next great event? Famine. Oh, it's as logical as daylight follows dark. Famine, see? All right, that's back in Revelation 6. And then, verse 8. Or verse 7, then he sees the fourth angel and the fourth creature say, come and see. Now verse 8, and I looked and behold a pale horse and his name that sat him was death and hell followed with him and power was given unto him over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and hunger and with death and so forth. All right, put two words in that scenario, and what would it be? Death and destruction. Not peace and safety, death and destruction. All right, now for sake of time, I'm going to jump right over to Revelation chapter 14 
And I'm not going to look at the companion portion in Isaiah for sake of time, but if you want to put it in your notes, that would be in Isaiah 63, where this final judgment that's going to come on planet Earth is likened to putting grapes in a grape vat. Now it stands to reason when they harvested the grapes and they threw them into this huge hollowed out stone, they can't just let those grapes sit there, so what do they have to do? Crush them. Crush them, one way or another. Now the one that we saw in Israel for a demonstration, they'd put a couple teenage kids in there and they would stomp them barefooted. But the whole idea was to crush the grapes so that the juice would run out of a trough on the bottom. All right, now this is used symbolically of God bringing in the armies that are left in the world to the valleys of Israel, which will become God's grape vat. Okay, Revelation chapter 14. And uh, we'll start at verse 14 and do this quickly. I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Speaking of a harvest. Another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice, who sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. It's time for God's final judgment. And he that sat on the cloud, verse 16, thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, having also a sharp sickle. And another angel came out who had power over fire, cried to the loud cry to him who had the sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. Verse 19, the angel thrust in his sickle, gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great winepress, not of a vineyard, but of the wrath of God. All right, now we got to do a little thinking. The vast military that's still left by the end of the seven years of the tribulation, of course, will be the Orient. China has boasted 200 million men army ever since Mao. We're still going to have the millions down in Africa and Europe. I'm maintaining that Russia and America and the Muslim world is already gone. All right, but all these armies that are left of the world, the Antichrist is going to put out the command to bring them to the Middle East to get rid of the Jewish problem. Get rid of Israel once and for all. Well, it'll be a God-directed thing. It's going to be supernatural. And so these men, not knowing really what they're doing, are going to command the armies to make their way to the nation of Israel, and they're going to pack them into the valleys of Israel. Now, we normally think of the Valley of Megiddo the Valley of Esdralon, which runs from the northern part of uh, the Sea of Galilee straight west to uh, Mount... Uh, well, I would lose the name of that one. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Carmel. You can stand on Mount Carmel and you can see the Valley of Megiddo. But you see, just a few miles north is another large valley, flat as a tabletop, called the Hula Valley, which used to be swamp. And when the Jews came back from their dispersion, the first thing they did was drain those swamps, and it's now great farmland. Flat valley. All right, then along the Mediterranean coast, you've got another valley of Sharon, or Sharon. That's the third one. And then you've got another valley, which makes up the Jordan Valley. Now, there you've got the Jordan Valley. You've got the valley of Sharon. You've got the valley of Jezreel, or the valley of Esdralon, or Megiddo, whatever you want to call it. And you've got the Hula Valley. Now, those valleys will hold millions upon millions of troops. You know, I read an interesting statistic years ago, not that many, but probably in the last 10 years, that every man, woman, and child in America could be put in the city limits of Jacksonville, Florida. Now, I didn't dream that up. Somebody else did. Because Jacksonville, Florida has a large land area. I looked it up on the map. But you see, when you put people in like sardines in a can, you can get millions in a small space. And God's going to do it. He's going to cause these army generals, stupid as it may seem, to pack their armies into these valleys of Israel. Why? It's God's grape vat. The human beings are the grapes. 
But like I said at the beginning of all this, when you get them in the vat, what do you have to do next? You've got to crush them. Okay, now let's just jump across the page in my Bible to chapter 16, and here we have the crushing element. Millions upon millions upon millions of the world's troops packed into the valleys of Israel, and here comes the final judgment. Revelation 16, verse 21. This is the last judgment before the seven years ends and God brings in the scenario for the kingdom. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone the weight of a talent. If you got a marginal help, it's what? 100 pounds. 100 pound chunks of ice are going to come cascading down on these millions of men out there in the open field. So what have you got? You've got a river of melting ice and blood that will indeed run as deep as a horse's bridle. I think if it isn't already topographical or possible, God will make it, and that river of blood will find its way to the Jordan Valley, and it's going to run all the way to the Red Sea, which is, as it says here, 180 miles. That's what's coming. That's the wrath of God. And all of the things from the day that the peace is taken from the earth at the 11th month of the seven years, it's nothing but death and destruction. Everything pertaining to the second coming is death and destruction. Now let's go back and show how Paul warns us for our final days on the planet, and that's going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And I shared with the conference last week, I was driving home from one of my classes in Oklahoma here a few, few years ago now, Turned on talk radio about 9.30 that night, and I happened to catch Michael Reagan. He was just starting his program, and he says, Fellow Americans, last night as my wife and I were having our family devotions, I read 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting at verse 1. And he says, When I was through, my wife said, Michael, you have to read this on the air. And so he says, Fellow Americans, that's what I'm going to do. And he read. And here it is. Read with me. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. This know also that in the last days... Now you want to remember, Paul has only one last day in mind, and that's the body of Christ. He's not concerned about prophecy. He's dealing only with the Gentile body of Christ. So in these last days, perilous times shall come. Men shall be lovers of them own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness and denying the power thereof from such turn away. And Michael stopped and says, fellow Americans, this is where we are. Is it? It's tomorrow's newspaper. It's next week's newspaper. It's exactly where we are. But, now here's my point. Is there one word of death or destruction? Not a word. Now, isn't that amazing? This is the scenario that you and I can look for at the trumpet call. We don't have to look for vast devastation. We don't have to look for millions upon millions of people being put to death. In fact, I made the point the other night in uh, Revelation chapter 6, when at the midpoint of the tribulation it says one-fourth of the world's people will be killed. Good heavens, what's one-fourth of seven billion people? 
five billion, not million, one and three quarters billion people are going to be dead by the end of the first three and a half years. We can't imagine what that's going to be like. But by the end of the seven, they're just about all going to be dead. They're just going to be a little smattering of survivors around the planet. But see, Paul doesn't allude to that. Paul says it's a breakdown of moral and spiritual things. See the difference? Why that's as different as daylight and dark. You and I aren't going to be part of that death and destruction. This is what we look for. All right, now in the two minutes I have left, let's just capitalize on this. Verse 2. Lovers of their own selves instead of lovers of God. True? Well, you know it is. Nothing matters to the human race today like the economy. And it isn't just America, it's everywhere. All people are concerned about is how much money they can make. And that's all centered on self. All right, now I'm going to go all the way down to the fifth verse because this is the one that slaps us in the face every time we turn around. We're in a time where people have a form of godliness. Any power? None. It's all flim-flam. I call it hip-hop religion. And that's all it is. There's no power of God in it. I had one of my converts out of Roman Catholicism call from uh, Chicago after Christmas time. She had gone with a friend to one of these large mega churches and says, Les, I was in that church for a little over an hour and never once heard the name of Jesus Christ. Not once. Well, what is that? Oh, it's church. It's a form of godliness. But there's no power. There's no preaching of the gospel. It's a feel-good religion. I could name them, but I don't like to do that. That's not my style. I'm just going to show the truth and let you let the chips fall where they may. But see, this is where I'm making such a dividing line between the body of Christ, which was a secret kept mind to God, never revealed in any of the prophetic statements, not one iota, it has nothing to do with the death and destruction of the end time scenario. And then they ridicule us for believing that we're going to be taken out. Why shouldn't we be? Man, this is the glory of being in the body of Christ. This is our blessed hope. Okay. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick.